Right. So I think we will get started. And uh, just to let everybody know that we are recording the event um, and there will be a replay on YouTube um, afterwards. Um, sorry, just letting a few more people in and then we will kick off. So absolutely delighted tonight to welcome two of my favorite people from Canada who should have been here in person. So that is Gillian Fortin and Ali Mashayeki. And they are the very dynamic writing, producing, and also acting duo um, who are with us tonight to talk about everything you need to know um, about getting from an idea in your head to meeting people to then getting your content actually made. Um, so over to you, Ali and Gillian, if you want to take the floor. Sure. Uh, thank you for having us, as always, Jenny. Um, I know we, we have a limited amount of uh, minutes here. We have an hour. So I'm going to just actually jump right into it with Gillian. Um, and I'm going to present this conversation as sort of like a case study for everyone. Because um, two years ago, Gillian and I actually had no idea who we were. We had never met. And this is like right sort of like in the beginning of COVID. It wasn't even two years ago, Jillian. It was probably like a year and a half, I would say, August of 2020, right? That's when we officially met. Um, yeah. We were like Facebook friends a little bit yeah, before that. Because exactly. that was all and, about networking. Yeah. And like, you know, how many of your Facebook friends you actually end up really meeting? You know, not that many. They're just there, right? Yeah. So um, what, so I'm a producer, I have a production company and I predominantly work in short films. Um, it's just somewhere that I found a comfort zone and success and it's just something I enjoy doing. So I've been doing it now essentially for like 10, 12 years. Now I have done features, I've done uh, documentaries, music videos, TV pilots, you name it. But uh, as a passion, I always sort of come back to shorts. And um, it's a good breeding ground for talent. And that's sort of how I see it. I, I, a lot of my uh, uh, friends right now that are like active in Hollywood, they started making short films with me. Um, the most prominent one being uh, Mina Masood, who plays Aladdin in the Aladdin live action remake. Um, him and I knew each other for like eight or nine years. Our relationship started with him being in a short film of mine and then a few other films. And then he blew up and he is where he is. So. I, me and Jillian, we've talked about how we're going to talk about this class, but, or this session, I guess I should say. And it's more about like how it's entirely possible to create a connection, cultivate it, and then leverage it to your benefit. And I think we're sort of like a living example of that, of that description. So we'll go back and forth as we sort of like tell this story and how it sort of came to be, and then we'll open it up to, to some questions. But um, I, I'm not as active on Facebook as I used to be. In fact, I'm not even on it anymore. But when I, when I was, um, more so during COVID, um, I use it as a uh, opportunity to just find talent that I never knew existed, basically. So what we did was we just put up this very simple ad that said, hey, this entire week, we're open to anyone who wants to pitch any idea or any concept to us. And then I just let it be. And then the DMs came in. And then Jillian, I guess, had seen that ad, right, Jill? Yeah, I so did. So what, what, what did you do when you saw it? You know, because I'm, I'm officially some other random production company who's basically saying, hey, we want to make a movie with you. So what was the process for you when you saw that ad kind of appear on Facebook? Yeah, yeah. okay. So I'm going to give just like a little bit more of a background on who I am. Um, so I was primarily a actor. Um, and then the pandemic hit and a lot of the industry sort of slowed down to a halt and I didn't know what to do with myself. Um, I needed to somehow uh, channel my creative sort of energy and I started doing monologues and then I was like, well, what if I write the best monologue ever, put it out there and the world will see how great I am. And then, so I did a monologue and then I was like, that's great. What if I designed the best character for myself? And then I slowly started writing more and more till I generated a world and then a story. And then I started creating all these short little stories um, just to keep myself busy. And it was a way for me to kind of promote myself. But then when I saw um, Landed Entertainment and what Ali was uh, talking about the pitch session, 
I was like, this is great. I've been working on, I think, three months now of the pandemic on a whole bunch of different stories. Maybe I'll tackle actually pitching something to him. So I reached out and I was like, oh, I have this great idea. And he's like, that's fantastic. I'd love to hear it. Um, I drove down to Toronto, had no idea what I was doing. I printed off this ginormous pitch package, which was 10 times bigger than the actual script. And I sat down and just started talking about the project. Now, prior to actually going in on this, I did do research on what to do for a pitch package pitch. Uh, and a lot of it said research who you're talking to. So I decided to research what London Entertainment was and if it would be a good partnership for me. And one of the things that stood out was they're constantly creating content. They're constantly creating shorts. They are doing really good in the festival market. And specifically, they do genre and sci-fi. So I was like, all of these were just like being checked off the box of things that were important to me. So when I went down there, I, I really wanted to form this partnership. Now, maybe it wasn't going to be with this specific pitch package, but I wanted to just make an impression because I felt like it would be a good partnership. So that's sort of what I did prior to leading up to our wonderful meeting that we had. So I don't know if you want to take it from there, yeah, Ali. Yeah, yeah. Jill, Jillian walks in, and um, again, the first thing that stood out was this thick binder, and I was just super curious as to what is possibly in this that A she needs to bring, and then like be like you know in the context of a short film, like what are you giving me in this binder? So she put it on the table, and my my it was right on my eyesight, and that was just my focus. Like, what is this binder? It was a little bit distracting. I told her afterwards because I could never figure out what the purpose of it really was in that meeting, but. Jillian pitched me an idea that I just didn't like. It wasn't for us. It wasn't something I was interested in. And we weren't going to do it. However, in that process of her pitching this, this uh, 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 I guess it was like, was it, what, what was it? A web series or like a TV series? I don't even remember. Yeah, don't it was a dark comedy. Yeah. yeah I, focused a lot on mental health. Given the pandemic, I was very inspired. And that sort of sparked our communication. Right. But, but the point is, is like, like I, I was hearing the pitch, the pitch wasn't interesting to me, but the person pitching had a lot of passion and a lot of um, excitement for that project. And that comes through in almost every case. If you're talking to someone and if you as writers have this particular passion for your project, um, just, just in, in your presentation that will exude, it will come out. And, and it was noticeable with Jillian, like she, she really wanted to do something that something was specifically this project but that was an easy thing for me to adjust because after that meeting I was never going to do that film but Jillian had gotten me um uh interested in her energy in in, in the fact that she wants to create content so that allowed for us to have a follow-up conversation where I just basically said okay this particular thing is not for me I'm not interested but like, do you have something else? Do you want to talk about another project? Which is always key all the time, right? You want to have like multiple projects sort of like at various stages of development because if Jillian at that point kind of said, no, I have nothing else, that kind of was the end of our sort of like interaction and relationship because there was nothing else to talk about. This one thing didn't appeal to me. Um, so she happened to have something. So I got in touch with her, I think, not even sure exactly how quickly, but I got in touch with her few maybe days or a couple of weeks later and we sort of had this conversation where I said not this project but do you have something else and Jillian took advantage of that opportunity how Jill well I think in our first initial conversation it was really crucial to understand who you were as a person um, to then be able to sort of cater my next couple of moves to your liking so, oh, um, like I said, I understood that Landa did a lot of genre and sci-fi and in getting to know you more, um, I could kind of critique sort of my next couple of pitches more to your favor. So maybe dark comedy is not your thing for me, uh, at least with me it wasn't. So then I really focused more on the sci-fi angle, um, which sort of came up in our conversation when we first met, which is really important because you are pitching your project, but you're also pitching your um, so at least when I pitched myself, that was a successful project, not so much. Um, so when we talked, I think I gave you 
five different pitches um, with our follow-up conversation. And we discussed sort of the angles of each one and we narrowed it down to two. And then I was like, okay, give me a week and I'll put something together for you. Um, and I think the first one that I put together was like the sci-fi that we're still constantly working on. Um, but I have finally landed something for Valley and with landed entertainment. And um, so that was great, but I also wanted to get in the door a little bit more. So I kind of opened myself up to like, whatever exposure landed could give me, I really wanted to take. So I was like, do you mind if I just come sit down, volunteer for you guys, whatever you need. Um, that's sort of how I was able to sort of strengthen the relationship a little bit more and uh, always make sure that that project that I pitched was always on the back burner because I was developing a relationship. So I didn't want it to go cold. I was sort well, of like, well, attack. That's, that's actually the, 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 the point I want to emphasize on. Um, whether you realize it or not, you had a very strategic strategy in place. So mm -hmm. what, what, she, what she had done was like, in the presentation, she had made herself somebody that grabbed my attention, like it was an impressive presentation. She had multiple projects that, and that put herself in a position where if I don't like something, she always has something else that her and I can discuss. She had also done her research, right? So she knew that I personally, and then my company, for the past few years was focused on genre and sci-fi. So she was coming with content that we were theoretically interested in right out of the gate. She was giving us a great presentation. And then she did the one thing any production company or producer is always looking for. Somebody who says, hey, I want to volunteer. Well, great, come and volunteer. Like bring some thing to the table that's just not a good idea. Like people have good ideas all the time. And I, I, I get presented to me good ideas all the time. Now, here's the thing. So last year we did seven short films. Um, this, this year we did probably about eight or nine. Um, they're all good ideas. But the thing is like, I had 20 good ideas in front of me. So like more than half of them never ended up getting made, right? Because there was other elements missing from that presentation. The individual wasn't the right fit. Um, they weren't bringing any other additional resources to the table. So it's, so it's just not enough to have a good idea, right? Especially if you're, ta if you're taking it to um, a company who then sort of like specializes in quote unquote good ideas or like short films. Well, then where is the competition going to be for you, right? Like how are you going to break through, through that wall? And Jillian um, had a few things going for her. She had multiple ideas. She had the right attitude. She was affable and social and then at the end um was willing to volunteer so that volunteerism also allowed for her so it's not like you guys from a standpoint of volunteering i think it's gotten a bad rep but if you know how to volunteer properly it's like it, the key to the kingdom because jillian was finding herself in all the key areas where a she's seeing how i'm making decisions she's seeing what type of projects i'm rejecting she's involved in e reading a ton of scripts like we would get anywhere between what like three to ten scripts a week right jill and you were yes. reading every single one of them yeah right so you were either regurgitating them back to me where i was saying no or i was saying yes but then Jillian is like, wait, what, why is Ali saying yes on this script? So she's getting an insider understanding of like from a production standpoint, which scripts are getting made. Like we'll use this one as an example. Let's not give the writer's name, but Bugged, right? Oh, so yeah. Bugged is a good script. Mm -hmm. And the writer has, I think eight or $9,000 it can contribute towards a short film. So mm -hmm. it's sci-fi, it, it has at least, I would say like one third of its budget. Um, already, um, and it's a really, really good script. And we can't make the script. Why we can't make it is because the scope of it is too big. It's a short film that requires like $20,000 of CG to, to actually get it to be at a level that it needs to be, right? And, and, and it just can't get made. So there are these situations where like even all the pieces are, are, are in place. And, and we still can't pull the trigger on it because logistically it's an issue. Now, the writer can't really adjust for that because it's a good script. It should be the way that it is, right? But like as writers, all of you guys, you have complete control over your attitudes. You have complete control over the slate of projects you have. So if the writer of Bugged had multiple scripts, I would have read every single one of those. And when I say I, Jillian would have read every single one of those. 
and would have come back and said like this one's good or not or whatever right but but he only had that one and then he lived and died with that one single script and even though he had eight thousand dollars and maybe somebody along the way is going to like hoodwick him into doing it for eight thousand dollars it's going to turn out to be shit because in reality it should have been like a thirty thousand dollar film right but my point is like jillian in that volunteering aspect that she brought herself into the project, um, allowed herself to understand from a producer's perspective how productions happen, what decisions go into making it. And then she actually used that in her advantage moving forward. So fast forward to uh, Social Industrial Meltdown, which was a short film that we wanted to do with a stellar international cast. Right? Mm -hmm. So then Jillian figured out a way to infuse herself into that equation. How did you do that, Jill? with money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, first of all, I read the script, absolutely loved it. And I remember in that meeting, I instantly volunteered myself. I think this industry, you need to be really, really hungry and not be afraid to go after what you want and be vocal about it. So right away, they were looking for someone to play the main character. And I was just like, I don't know how, but I want to do it. Let me know how. Um, so I jumped on board in the producing team as well. And had to take on a lot of responsibilities to help make sure it came to life before just actually getting the gig walking on set and you know performing when they say action um and i was also able to raise up a little bit of money and experience what that was like to raise money uh, and contribute that way as well so that was how i was able to lock in that um uh, project that we did which yeah, sort yeah. of to me was ideal because it was horror sci-fi and a strong female character um it was something I was really really passionate about and I was just gonna try every angle to make sure that I was able to land it yeah because you also are an actress and yeah. and that gave you and that gave you a great opportunity because it was an ensemble cast it yeah. was shot internationally in Italy Canada Mexico United States Iran Australia and one some other place that I'm forgetting it was it was uh, eight different oh China so it, it was shot in eight different places with actors from those countries. And, and, and Jillian found a way to actually be the star of it and a producer on it and, and got to see how that process is now being, how, how the process of a short film gets mm -hmm. done. And she did it during COVID. So like, so everything about, but how she's only in that position because you know, months ago, she chose to want to volunteer. And she's only in that position because months ago, she came into that meeting with multiple, uh, no, sorry, not multiple, with, with a good attitude to pitch. And then when her project got rejected, she, she, could, she was in a position to say, I have other things as well too. So she, and one of the things I need to say here for everybody to understand, this is a key thing that Jillian in this type of setting always purposely doesn't mention, but I'm gonna always mention it on her behalf, okay? Life is hard. Everybody has a bunch of things going on. Okay. So here's a couple of things about Jillian. She's a mother of two daughters, ages uh, six and eight, right, Jill? Yeah. Close, right? Okay. Also a nurse and also lives four hours away from Toronto. So she actually, when she, when she volunteered, she would drive for four hours, like leaving her house at like five in the morning, coming to Toronto, sometimes for a two hour meeting and then driving back for four hours. So the passion and dedication and motivation was always, always there. So it was very easy for me to say, this person needs an opportunity. All you got to do is give them an opportunity because she is completely driven, literally and figuratively, to be there to get all of this stuff done, right? And that, that's the energy level that any producer, any content creator is attracted to. Like, you just want these people who want it more than anything else and then have a game plan on how, how to implement it and have no excuses for it. And the thing is, she kept that away from me for the first three months. I didn't even know that she, she lived four hours away. Sometimes I would assign her meetings for 20 minutes, guys, and she would be there. Like, so she's either like crazy or she's crazy. Either way, that's the crazy that we want, right? Like, I want to work with somebody who's crazy like that. Why wouldn't I, right? So, mm -hmm. so now she comes and she does um, uh, uh, social industrial meltdown and she does this film with us. She gets this experience and, and, is in a position where she can come to me 
And this is the key thing. Like she did it with a lot more tact and, and, and respect, but she can come to me and say, Hey, yo buddy, I've been helping you out. I helped you raise money. I'm reading all these shitty scripts. I'm reading all these amazing scripts. I'm doing all these favors for you. Now it's my turn for you to do a favor. And guess what? Of course I'm going to want to do a favor. So what ends up happening is we look at Jillian's career as a writer and we say medium long-term strategy. And we look at her career as an actress. And we say short-term ability to help her out because I'm a production company, right? Like I, I represent opportunities and maybe all of you guys are, are predominantly writers, but I promise inside of some of you, there's a bit of directing going on, maybe a bit of producing, maybe somebody wants to delve into acting, but then if you are associated with a production company, that production company can essentially help with any of those things. So then Jillian and I started having acting conversations because that's part of her career that she wanted to also fast track. So what do we do to, to help out with your acting, Jill? Um, well, there were several shorts already lined up um, for production in 2021. And we looked at the script, we looked at the characters, we sort of decided which ones we should focus on, which I had to audition for every single one. Um, but it was very strategic, which ones would benefit my career um, and sort of the image that I want to sort of create for myself, um, which can also help with the IMDb, um, which is always something that people look at when they're sort of first meeting you. Um, I'm sure Allie looked at my IMDb when I first went in and was like, there's not a lot here. Um, so we were establishing that, which is great because then I was able to build relationships that Ali has cultivated over the last 13 plus years that he's been in the industry. So every opportunity that he allowed me to partake in, I took full advantage of. Can I build a relationship with that director? Maybe he'll like my writing style and I can work with him on another project. Can I build a relationship with that fellow actor? or whatever it may be. I just remember every opportunity, there's multiple angles you gotta work. So we well, sort of, uh, yeah. Yeah, like yeah. The, the strategy there is, um, and I'm reverbing with somebody's audio here, but um, the strategy there is a couple of things. So um, first off, Jillian had ensured with her work ethic and her approach and her creativity and her content, she put me in a very easy situation to be able to promote and market her and to be able to introduce her to people because after a year of interacting with her, I had no doubt where with Jenny, for example, we came to London uh, like two, three months ago and we had a meeting and I introduced you to Jillian. And I said, here's all these things that we're working on. And then Jillian and Jenny connected, right? But like if, if, I, if that partnership between Jillian and I was not cultivated through talent, through work ethic, through trust, through diversity, then I wouldn't be bringing that to Jenny or anybody else for that matter. And then that relationship would have died a long time ago, right? So every single one of you guys have the ability to find the right partner that is creating the content that you're interested in and then cultivate that relationship because Jillian and I were actually not friends before we met. And then when we met, we didn't start off on the right creative foot. It was just, I didn't want to do the project, right? But she took the healthiest, most appropriate approach of having the conversation with me, showing that she's got other projects, putting her head down and just working really hard, not giving an excuse. Like you guys have to understand, we met in August and her volunteering basically started in like, I don't know, September, October, maybe of, of, of 2020. And then it's, she's in Sudbury, it's just north of uh, uh, Toronto. It's a lot more snow, a lot quicker. And somebody's driving for four hours and like, you know, four hours is no traffic no issues i mean that's like a six seven hour with a snowstorm drive coming to toronto for a 30 minute meeting and keeping it a secret like that's the type of people you know that you want to work with but the relationship is like i gotta now give back to her right because if she's gonna put in that effort she almost sort of like puts me in a position to do better to do better for her because if she's doing it a dry day I gotta make sure she's in the film I gotta make sure she does that but then she also has the talent to back it up so I'm not doing her any favors and as she said she auditioned for every single thing that she got so this wasn't a relationship where like she's getting freebies it was just a relationship where like somebody who had certain work ethic and talent and wanted to write and had multiple projects that she was developing presented herself well to a production company that could take her in 
And these production companies exist out there for all of you guys. You just need to find the right ones and you just got to research it. And then once you start building that relationship, um, it just becomes like snowball effect, right? You just get more and more out of it. Um, not to like, you know, jump too far into the future, but like Jillian basically um, starred in her first uh, uh, feature film that we've been working on for the past few years, which was an anthology, but like she basically plays the lead in it. Um, not because anybody gave, did a favor for her, but like by the time we got to that point of casting, it was kind of like a no brainer. We're like, wait a minute, like we're cultivating her career here. We're, we're trying to get her to be a star. So why wouldn't we put her in the film that we're going to come out with on our feature? Because like if she is that star that we think she's going to be, we're going to benefit from it, right? And I remember I went to Julia to say, hey, you want to start in this feature film? I'm not going to pay you anything, but it's going to be a feature film that you're going to start. Well, the answer was like, absolutely yes, right? Like, why would I, why would she not want to do it, right? And, and, and then she started associate producing with me. And then I strategically brought her on projects that I felt like, A, um, it wasn't taking too much time away from her career as an actress and also was within her skill set. So now she um, produced, produced this um, basically intentionally shot um, Blair Witch style found footage film that we did during COVID that is called Witch's Midnight. And it's already won um, two best films at, uh, at genre awards uh, festivals and not the shitty ones that happen like once a week i mean like the ones that are actually like you know you know people people know of right and 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 yes she's not leveraging that necessarily as a producer but the body of work is beginning to get strong and that body of work is all being cultivated essentially during covid right and i say this to everyone i've made more films in the past two years during covid than I did um, at any other calendar year. Um, and it was entirely because everybody was available. Like we got Esme Bianco from Game of Thrones in, in, in a film. Ah, she was available. We reached out and she was available and she played Roz, if anybody watched Game of Thrones. Um, and, and she was just, and you know, we got her and she's in our film. And actually um, that particular film screened at Rain Dance uh, this year as well. So, so um, it, you know, we, you have to take advantage of the opportunities and, and talking to you guys as writers and, and Jillian being a writer, she absolutely took advantage of that opportunity, right? Whereas like she worked her way up in the, in the, in the structure of my company as like now, like probably like, you know, top two or three position in the company has autonomy, has, has, has the ability to bring other people into the mix is now getting acting opportunities directly from our projects and indirectly from other projects has, um, a short film that, you know, if you want to briefly describe of all the pitches that you pitched to me, you finally got my attention, not in the sense of that those other ones weren't good, but in the sense of like, okay, I'm going to do this one. Mm -hmm. and, tell, and you should describe it, Jill, from a standpoint of like taking advantage of everything in the past two years that we sort of learned, because mm -hmm. your film is actually the result of two years of working with me directly as a producer. Want to talk about it a little bit and then we can open it up to questions. Anybody yeah, yeah for sure. Um, so I was constantly always pitching to him, always. Got a new idea, got a new idea. And this one that I pitched, um, it's called Portrait of Consumption. And the reason why I think it intrigued Ali is because as I got to know him more, I got to understand his style of filming, um, sort of how he likes to, it's, it's, I guess, sort of how he likes to take the script and then convert it into like this beautiful imagery. And, and so I wanted to make it very abstract for him. So that would grab his attention because it's not a typical script. The content dealt with a lot of sort of dark um, issues that sort of critique society, which also grabs his attention. That's our favorite topic when we're having uh, coffee together is just critiquing society. Um, all these things that I was able to kind of pick apart on Ali's personality, I was able to kind of create in a story um, and, and, and present it in a way that was unique, something he hasn't done before, someone that always does shorts has seen it all so how can I present something that he's never seen before um so yeah when I pitched the project to him it I think 
intrigued him, the content, and then how I was presenting it was something very unique. So right away, he was like, that's the one, Jillian. And uh, I was like, that's fantastic. I'm going to have a script for you by tomorrow. Um, and jumped on it right away because I don't want anything else coming and distracting. <laughs> so we are right now, script is locked. We have a few people. Or we've already gotten the storyboards done. Um, we have a composer attached to it. So it's a very exciting time for us. Um, it's going to be my second script that I've done with Lambert Entertainment because we've already done one short that I wrote. Um, and I am very, very excited about this one. But if it hadn't been for that year of just getting to know Allie, I don't know if this pitch would have gone as well because I specifically catered this project to everything that would intrigue Allie. Yeah, and just a few things that she's missing out on that is like, so I like shooting international. So the film shoots in six different cities around the world, instantly grabs my attention. I like abstract and dark. They do really well at festivals. Now, maybe coming out of COVID, people want to see happy stuff. And I get that. But guess what? The curve will always bend festival-wise to abstract and dark. It will always be the case. It will be in vogue forever, um, I believe. And maybe Elliot will say, Fuck no, and there's absolutely no, Ali, you don't know what you're talking about. But but Abstract and Dark historically have done well in festivals for me. And I've been in the festival game since um, since uh, uh, 2010, like actively, actively in it. Um, and and so, so Jillian, by spending a year with me, knew exactly what I wanted to do and what I didn't want to do. And all of that came from volunteering and all of that came from being involved in production. And, and, and everyone, everyone uh, 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 should always, like this, she, when, when I talked to Jenny about doing this, this session, I was like, I, I constantly get asked by writers, like, how do I go from A to B, from B to C? And the answer really fundamentally is partnering up with the right match. It's like anything else in life, right? Like a writer, producer, writer, director relationship is some sort of type of marriage. Right, and, and, and it requires communication, it requires understanding each other, and it requires that strong partnership that both of you kind of want to be, be in it. And it's like, it is a give and take, right? Jillian gave a ton of stuff up front and trusted that it's going to pay off later. But she had done her research. She had talked to people that knew me. So she was able to get some insight into like, who is Ali? How does he operate? And what does he do? And then in, in exchange for that sort of like patience and loyalty, all of these projects that originally were like just conversations that are all slowly coming into fruition, right? And if the answer is like, hey, where do you guys get the money and that sort of stuff, that's for another night. Like we can talk about that in the future and that has its own sort of like obstacles, right? But the reality of, is if there's like two of you or three of you doing it together as a unit with the same goals in mind, which is a success of the project, then you can place yourself as whatever that position you want it to be. So Jillian wants to be writer, and um, actress. So we are cultivating her career to reflect those two goals. She doesn't want to be a producer, but I strategically put her on projects as a producer that I know is going to give her clout and that she can leverage her filmmaking resume into advanced writing and producing. Okay. Um, it, 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 so it's, it's, really that partnership and that relationship, which I, I, I really advocate for everyone. And it doesn't matter where you are in your career. None of that stuff matters. Like if you find the right people with the same mindset and in the internet and obviously allows you to do your research, right? Um, she, she talked to lots of people about me. And even, even when we were still getting to know each other and working, she was doing her research because people would be like, hey, this chick by the name of Jillian reached out about something about like, who is she? And I was just like, oh, like she is, she's somebody who I'm working with who wants to understand more and more stuff about me, right? Because like, that's natural. And, and so, so it, allowed, it allowed for us to be honest and forthright and, and then just build on exactly what the goal is. And the goal is just like great content. Um, is that, like, that's sort of like the, the, sort of like the combination of it right now is, is she's gotten her first part with us. She's, this is the second that she's writing with us. Um, she's now involved in the company making decisions. She has shares in the company. Like her situation has gone from literally a pitch a year and a half ago that did not go well to a major player in the production company in literally less than a year and a half during COVID. So like, here's a story that like 
people say it can't happen. I'm telling you it happened. Like, here it is. She's right there. It's happened. And then let's not forget like mom and like lives a million miles away. Like there's that to, to, to sort of like add to the mix. But um, I'm, I'm always looking to partnering up with anyone. There's always room to just strengthen the team. Uh, you just exponentially grow. And, and so I think you guys need to find uh, producers and production companies that you feel like you can at least on a creative level merge with. And then, and then in that context, find the right people that on a personal level you can get along with. And then just if it's possible for you to start volunteering and then understand more and more and more if, if you don't have that knowledge base. But if you already have that knowledge base, just come in hard and start, um, start uh, 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 you know, that relationship at, at a couple of levels ahead, right? If you, if you already have those contacts. And Elliot's saying the trick is to get them to call you. Um, yeah, uh, I, and, and, and the thing is, I, and Jillian will attest to this, you know what her number one task as originally as a volunteer was for me. And then uh, remember Jill, do you remember I said, I go stop people from getting in touch with me. That was her job. The first Which thing that so I gave hard, her. Cause I can't say no. So then yeah. I would end up having these hour long conversations with people, but he didn't talk to them. I did. <laughs> yeah. I, I, Jillian's job became, so there's this one saying that I genuinely believe, and it's a really terrible way to look at the industry, but it really is like this. So there's this like tiny door everybody's trying to get into. Right. And only like one person gets into at a time. And as soon as you get across that door, your job now becomes trying to closing that door because you don't want anybody else to actually come in after you, right? Like it's sad, but it's actually, actually true, right? Because there is, there is this, um, uh, you know, like if, if Jillian wants my attention to, for me to create her projects and I have a finite amount of resources that I could give, right? So when she's in, in that door, her focus actually is to just maintain my interest. Not, not like, you know, in any weird way, in the sense of like, you know, we can only do six or seven projects a year. So like if more people are now in that door, right? If some people can get a, get a hold of me and pitch to me, her odds decrease of, of the projects that, that she wants to do. It's just the way it is because from a quantitative standpoint, right? But so yes, like as a producer, as a production company, um, I don't wanna be re returning calls. I don't wanna take meetings, generally speaking. I just want to interact with whoever somehow, some way find their, themselves on the other side like get into that door, like if at a festival, like, you know, when I, when I come to rain dance, um, one of the things that when people give me their cards, I'm like, why are you giving me your card for? I'm like, you're putting the responsibility on me to get in touch with you. I won't, I'm telling you, I won't. But if you try to get my card, now you have the power, right? Like you have my number, you have my email, you can begin your harassment campaign, right? So it's like, it's, it, there is a lot of competition for attention, but my point is um, if you are, organized, if you're a hard worker, if you have multiple projects and you do your research on which production company or individual you want to talk to, then you increase your odds of getting in on them. And then when you do, like it's, it's hard to, it's hard to uh, 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 sort of lose that position. Um, Jillian, Jillian's comfortable with shit. She's not in competition right now with anyone else. Um, but that could, that could also happen. And then it becomes like, okay, Jill, your next project needs to have like, you know, something else to it because Johnny's, you know, made it into the, into the firewall. Right. And, and then that's, that's how it is as a producer, right? Like you, you, you look at all of the elements and you just want to make like whatever you think is the best project with the, uh, uh, <laughs> Randall's just going in with it. Yeah. Randall, I change it every year, buddy. So which one do you have? No, I'm kidding. It's the same one. It's the same one. Um, um, uh, so, <laughs> um, I, I'm open to any of you guys. Every time we do these sessions, I, I say the same thing. And I always say, I go, I am open. If you can find a way, um, get away. Like I will make your film. And, and Jenny, I think like two years ago, remember, uh, we optioned somebody in one of these sessions. Uh, we optioned somebody's script. I think it was Joseph Arnold. He was, he was pitching and, 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 and maybe it was a live ammo. I'm not sure what it was, but it was a Zoom thing. Like we, we uh, yeah, Emma, call Jillian. I, I, it's, that's a strategy, call Jillian. Um, but, 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 so, but we do, we do, we do make stuff like that happen. And, and um, I, I also say this too, just, just I'm going to leave it on a, on a really good piece of note here. Okay. So um, anybody with me can make a project and I promise you it'll be phenomenal in the sense that if I'm making it with you, all efforts go into it. Um, and I knew someone for about six or seven years, 
Uh, he finally came in with a project, uh, convinced me to do it. Uh, it's a short film. It's costs us now around $80,000 to make. It's very, very CG heavy. It's heavy, heavy, heavy CG. Um, very abstract, very dark. The quality and the standard of, of the film is really, really high. And then we're like, we have a really strong film. So we, we decided we're gonna chase a big name to do the narration. And we chased, and we chased, and we chased for a year and a half to get this big name. And then what ended up happening is we didn't get him. But what we did get was somebody that I think is now better than who we actually got. So the film that I'm talking about, the name is Spaceman. It's gonna come out in 2023, guys. And I shot it in 2021, a short film. But uh, the narrator of the film is J.K. Simmons from Whiplash. Pretty cool, right? Pretty, pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, we got him. We got him. And Jillian and I were like vomiting in buckets, you know, trying to just get through the negotiation. But the negotiation worked out beautifully. I don't want to give the details of it here because it is being recorded. But like it worked out really, really beautifully. The point is um, I took a strong project to him. And yes, he could have said no creatively or whatever, but like it was strong. And there are ways to just, you know, you can get the Esme Biancos, you can get the JK Simmons on your short film. I don't know if, I know baseball is not like a thing in, in the UK, but like we just made a, a film with a major Canadian baseball player that like won the championship in 1992 and it's a big deal. And, and so all of these things, they're, they're doable, they're doable. It's just finding like the right, like it's, it's a puzzle. Right. So if you're not if you don't have it lined up properly, it'll never it'll never go. But like we can talk about that some other time. Um, yeah. So the J.K. Simmons thing is pretty cool. You guys are still like, you know, part of like the first tier of people finding out about it. We have not announced it. Hopefully we'll have like an article break on Variety or something when we actually like announce the film. But like we're pretty excited about that. Um, yeah. So any questions from anyone about anything? I know Jillian will have to duck out a slightly sooner than me about five, 10 minutes, but I'm happy to stay and uh, answer any questions. Um, yeah. Okay, good, no questions. You guys all know how to make it happen. Phenomenal, I wanna see lots of great films coming out of this group next year, okay? Every single one should be at every single festival. Um, uh, how are you making money on these short films? Aha! <laughs> um, you don't really make money on short films what you do with short films is so so i'm gonna answer it this way can you act as um how did you get jk's <laughs> elliot i'll never tell no i'll tell you actually um i told him i said i saw him at rain dance and and uh, i wanted to talk to him then because he was actually jk was at rain dance a few years ago i remember um yeah he was uh so it, it, how you make money on short films is two, two questions. So is the, how does a filmmaker make money on short film as an individual or how does a production uh, company make money on, on the short film? Which, are, which, which is of the two are you actually asking? Because they're both? Okay, so um, the filmmaker maybe can make some money off the short films. Elliot just sent you guys a link where you can try to sell it. Airlines generally buy short films relatively easily. Um, if your film is good and you're submitting to a reputable festival, um, if it's a reputable festival, they pay you in the sense, not all of them, the big ones don't like, you know, Sundance and Slam Dance and Rain Dance. Those big, big ones don't obviously pay you for screening, but the medium tier ones actually do. Some of them do. Um, and if you win festivals, uh, you can, you can get some money from that as well, too. Um, I, I, on average, get about 15 to 25% of my budget returning to me from screenings and wins. Now the wins are not always cash, always, most of the time are in-kind services, but then you leverage it, right? Like there, that has value to it. I've actually in the past sold a $2,500 post-production voucher for $1,800 cash. So like I did sell it, like it is money, right? It's a bit of a hustle. Yeah, I get it, it's a bit of a hustle, but like that, that that's um, tax rebates sometimes depending on, I, I don't know every country in Canada, it's kind of hard to get tax rebate refunds for short films because generally they need to have distribution. Um, but then as a production company, uh, we, we, when we make somebody's short film, we, we charge them anywhere between 10 to 50% uh, uh, service fee. So that's how the production company makes, makes the money there. Um, uh, if it's a film that we do in-house, it's usually entirely designed as a, uh, either a proof of concept or part of an anthology. 
Um, I got into the anthology business about five years ago. Uh, I've done two of them, full anthologies, and that's basically taking short films, connecting them together, and then selling them as a feature. Um, it works nice. Um, and now we're just exclusively doing genre anthologies, like the one that Jillian is starring in. That's a genre anthology, and that's how we're going to go. Um, tax rebates are super difficult. I don't recommend anybody making a short film with that strategy of return in mind. Um, what's the best way to approach a production company with a pitch? Um, I would say exactly what Jillian did. Um, Jillian, we happen to announce it, but like sometimes you go on certain websites of the production companies and they'll say like where they're sort of like uh, unsolicited material uh, portal is. Um, the best thing to do is find the individual, do your research on them and then connect with them directly, connect with them through social media directly. They're not always gonna answer, but like I'm, I'm, I'm telling you guys it works. Like I do eventually see somebody's message from like 10 months ago. Like I do, Every, everything I have. Can I also just add a little bit, Ali? Yeah, go ahead. I think it's really important to also understand who you are. So when you're bringing the pitch, what else are you bringing? Um, is it going to be, is there a big star attached to it? Is there a big, you know, director attached to it? Um, is there financing in place? Um, has your script won awards? There's lots of screen writing competitions. So anything that can help you stand out as well, um, or can you volunteer? What else can you bring to the table beyond just a script? Because like Ali says, he gets 30 great scripts a week. So whatever you can do to stand out, doing your research so you can tailor it to the person is great, but also understand what else you can bring to the table, I think is really, really important. Yeah, and, and, and it's hard. It's not, this is not an easy thing. Like you guys have to understand, Jillian and I, Jillian represents two people in the history of the past 15 years that have been able to crack through that wall. And hundreds and hundreds of people try, right? Because I just, I, I as a small, and I'm like, you know, a minuscule production company, but I still don't have the, 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 the um, um, capability and ability to just take on a really good script. There needs to be other elements associated with it. And again, you may not have money, but you do have your personality. You do have your work ethic. Tap into the things that you have, the resources that you have. Um, Ali, why aren't you involved in TV? It's as good as movies these days. Um, we are actually involved in TV. So we, we have four productions, two that are actually complete and two that are in uh, development and pre-production. Um, mm. We have an international one with Lionsgate. We have a domestic one in Canada with Bell Media. Um, we have a web series that just got finished that I, I personally think, I will go on record and say, if this thing doesn't find its way onto like Netflix or Hulu or whatever, I will retire in the next year. You guys have it on recording next year this time. If this thing's not on Netflix, then forget it. Like, it's just, I generally am not impressed by anything I do, but this thing that I did was, it, it impressed me at least to say, right? Um, yeah, like it's, it's I, I just, the secret to everything is partnership with the right people. Uh, me with Elliot, six, seven years ago, we, we met in a serendipitous way. And then Elliot introduced me to Jenny and, and Randall and all the, and it's just like these connections, like Ra Randall and I worked on this fundraiser charity that raised like $4,000 for a ha halfway house for actors in Los Angeles that didn't like basically actors who moved to LA became homeless and now stuck there. And then we paid, we, we've helped build this home that has like six, seven bedrooms that the actors can stay in and has a mini recording studio, mini green studio in it so they can continue working as actors and having a home over their head. Um, so, so like these relationships, it just like, you know, you find the right people and then you build on it. My dad always used to say, like, life is just a process of weeding people out. Just get rid of the people who are not contributing to your life in any way. And just stick to the ones that it's okay to be like tight with like 10 people. And that's it. Just be tight with just the core group of people that are progressing your career. Doesn't matter how old you are. Doesn't matter where you, where you live. None of that stuff. Find the right partners and it's worth searching for them. And it's worth cultivating it. It is, it has literally been the secret to all of my success. And if anybody wants like two hours, go on my IMDb and look at every single project and you will see year after year, the same names, as producers, as actors will appear on it. Because once I find a relationship that works, we just go down that path. We recreate work for the actors that we just want to work with. Like the scripts are written for them, literally. This one that, this one that Jillian just wrote, 
her and one of these house writers that we work with, Oswald Mahogany, they wrote it together knowing Jillian's going to be starring in it. And she does phenomenal in it because it puts a spotlight on all her skill set, right? So it's it's this like collaborative relationship, guys. Like it's 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 uh, yeah, Randall. Like that 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 helped big time, buddy. Like that was uh, uh, Navid Nagahman, who who is who's the guy who behind this charity. Uh, he was in uh, Homeland and he was in Aladdin. He played the Sultan. Uh, he put that initiative together as an actor who, when he moved from Germany to to LA, he struggled. And he just, he was basically borderline homeless. And it's shocking how many homeless actors are in LA. I mean, the homeless problem in LA is through the roof, but there's, there is a good deal of them being, being uh, actors. So um, that, that was a fun one we did. Um, and uh, if just, I, I will say this, like anybody who wants, actually Jillian, you'll attest to this. There is, a, there is a very fast track way to get my attention. It is actually to charitable work. Um, I'm involved in multiple charities. The current one is Enara. It is um, uh, uh, basically ran by some people from CNN, but also Amanda Seyfried from uh, Mamma Mia. She was nominated for an Oscar in 2020. And her, Tom, her, her husband, Thomas Sadowski, he's better known in the first two um, John Wick movies. Um, and we were just in New York. We did this fundraiser that raised, um, I think, like thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 for um, children in the Middle East who are uh, damaged by war situations, uh, uh, like burnt and maimed and all of that stuff. Um, we have right now on Instagram, if you follow me or landed, there's like an autograph art piece that I, um, I did that's autographed by Thomas Sadowski, Amanda Seyfried, Arwa Damon from CNN and Essie Cup from CNN. And we're, we're doing a blind bid for it. So anybody who wants to actually like put in a bid and you win it, we'll ship it to London or wherever you are. Um, and it goes to this like very, very important charity during Christmas time that does operations on these kids and try, tries to like fix them up. Um, it's, it's a really, really good one. So through charities, somebody says, Hey, Ali, I want to talk charity to you. Or somebody makes a donation and DMs me and says like, Hey, I donated X amount of dollars that will get my attention instantaneously. And we will talk about that. And, and it's true, right, Jill, because one of the, like the perks was like you and I went to this event in New York for one night and you met all of these celebrities and you were able to like establish a relationship with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, charitable stuff uh can you become involved in set charity work even if your time is split between london and nyc totally the the, the charity is international actually um and i'm in toronto and the head of the charity is in istanbul and the new york is just a hub for it and la is just a hub for it so yeah ch this particular charity doesn't matter where you are you can totally get involved in it um yeah randall that was that was phenomenal man that was that that experience that you and i had together was was really really good and we incorporated and it was it was a script competition by the way so like it was it was literally designed for writers i remember reaching out to randall about it it's like do you want to do this with me and he's like absolutely and we created an opportunity for writers to have their scripts be seen by um navid also um the, the, the i keep forgetting her name jill save me so i don't embarrass myself she was an x-man psylocke what was her name Everyone, somebody guess her name. I'll make your movie. She was in X Men. She played Psylocke. Um, she's she's this comedic. She was also in uh, Newsroom. Play her character's name was Salone something. God, ah, get it. Somebody get it. Now you're embarrassing me, Ali, because I don't know. I'm embarrassing everybody here. You guys don't know who she is. She's huge. As soon as I say her name, you'll be like, oh shit, her. Um, somebody. Was in, Sorry. Was it? From newsroom, was that Olivia? Olivia Munn. Oh, Olivia Munn. Yes, yes. Yeah, yes. yeah. Yes. Olivia Munn. She what? Oh, so said, you, have to make, you have to make my movie now. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, you said Olivia Munn. No, actually, Randall said Olivia Munn. Randall, you're dead to me, but no, I'm kidding. Uh, it's Olivia Munn. It's Olivia Munn. I'll make your film. But she, like, read the script of the winning script. Like, li literally read read the script, right, of... of the winning script. So if like the script was like something that appealed to her, there was an opportunity there, right? Um, so, anyways, the point is, um, just be uh, just be engaged and and just yeah. create opportunities for yourself. As network, as Jillian did. network network, get your stuff seen, and through that process, you're gonna find somebody that gets you, believes in you, and wants to root for you. So. 100%. Try every avenue possible. Don't just keep doing the same thing and hope one day it's going to work. Try everything. 
Um, and the more people you meet, the more likely you're going to find that partnership and make amazing stuff. That's 100% what I recommend. And be open to be flexible as well. So your first script, maybe they didn't like it. Have five others ready to go. So always be flexible too. But I have to run. Yes. I stick at my children because I'm also, like Ali said several times, a crazy mom. Um, <laughs> but thank you guys so much for letting us chat with you for the last hour of your lives. Um, I hope that I can read some of your scripts. I don't know if Ali will, but I definitely will. Um, I'm going to head out now, though. Nice thank you so you. much, Jillian. Thank, thank you so you. much, Jenny. Take care, everyone. Thank you for your time. See you soon. Yes, absolutely. Bye. <laughs> Oh, that was wonderful. Ali, you still around? Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm around. I'm Great. My, my screen is frozen, so I can't actually see you. Um, but there was another question in the chat, Ali, which was about how did you learn about the business side of production? Did you learn that as you went along or was it, um, you know, a lot of work beforehand? Yeah, entirely trial and error. Nothing. I, I didn't go to school for film. Uh, some of you might, like, who's been on some of these sessions, um, I went to University of Toronto for neurobiology. I was going to operate on some people at some point, um, just because immigrant parents, they don't, they don't bring you to Canada or the UK or the US to become filmmakers. They bring you to be like doctors and like contributors to society. Um, as, as my dad would like to say jokingly to his friends when they say, you know, what's, what's your son doing now? He still says, yeah, he's still making pornography because I'm obviously not, but filmmaking to him is pornography when I should have been a neurosurgeon. So um, yeah, it's, uh, I, I learned it through trial and error all the way. Um, I, I Second year of pre-med, I um, dropped out and started just making films and forcing it on my family and friends to buy you know, VHS and DVD copies of it at like hundred bucks a pop. And then we would take that money and make another film and make it a little bit better and sell it for like 150 until we got to about $500 a DVD where we were told like, never talk to me again. Dude, this is crazy. I'm not paying 500 bucks for a shitty film to follow your dreams. But at that point we'd gotten kind of good at it. So we started like, you know, um, actually like creating content that wasn't embarrassing. And then same approach to like, it was trial and error. And then to actually understand the business side of it was trial and error. I would go, I actually did this. This is crazy. I went to Khan in 2011 to the, um, the film market. And I didn't have a film in there. I got just the, the, the pass and I would sit like in front of booths literally for hours watching buyers and sellers and see how they actually sold and bought films. Um, and that's what I did. And then like, so I kind of learned the lingo. I kind of learned the bullshit associated with it that I can come back and fine tune. So I did, I genuinely have put a lot of my like genuine effort into it. It's not, a, it's not, if you don't put a hundred percent into it, you know, even at hundred percent, you don't get what you want at the end, but like 99%, you, you're wasting your time. Like it has to be at a hundred. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's my, my, my origin story is, uh, is, is a lot of trial and error and that's how I learned. So, um, uh, I'm not saying it's for everyone. I just had the, the psycho mentality of doing it. So I did it, but like people go to film school for it. And, and, and that, that there's something to be said about that as well. It just wasn't, just wasn't my path. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's that's amazing, Ali. I mean, is there, I mean, obviously, you know, some of the festivals have opened back up. Um, but, you know, if we are in for a bit of a longer haul with COVID, um, are there any other ways that you can sort of, you know, get that sort of experience that you got um, without physically going to a festival? I want to say, Jenny, yes. I have yet to find a replacement for the festival experience personally yeah. Uh, yeah. which is like i mean elliot knew ever, as soon as COVID started my like i was constantly like is rain that's happening how is it happening how are you going to organize it like i need to be there because i under I, like to me i understand the value of these festivals are so important to networking especially reputable ones like rain dance sun dance slam dance like every opportunity i get i go like i'm that guy who never does a vacation i'm that guy who does not spend money on anything other than festivals like i pour thousands and thousands of dollars into festivals I've gone to all the, all the good ones. I go multiple times. If I have a film, I go. If I don't have a film, um, I, I actually was in Rain Dance. And Randall, you were in um, Austin, I think. At that, and, and we won Austin's best short. 
which was like phenomenal. We were shocked. Like we really like our little LGBTQ film won best short at Austin. But like I wasn't there for it. I was at Raindance because I had done Austin and I know the type of people in Austin that um, I was going to network with were better suited for my director and my actress to network there for and my writers. I was like Raindance, producer goes. Austin, the writer goes. Maybe the director goes because it is a writer's festival. So we divided and conquered in that sense. But that's because like to me, uh, um, it, it, it really, the festival experience is, is phenomenal for any sort of filmmaker, aspiring, new, all of that stuff. And, and Elliot knows, like I, 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 will, I will say probably the most influential person and the most relevant um, a relevant part of my career in the past six, seven years has been Elliot and Raynet. Like I've, I've been able to leverage that in so many different ways. Um, and, and which is why like anything, anytime he asks me for anything, I'm there because I understand the value of it and, and good festivals like rain dance, um, are, 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 are really the key. And unfortunately, or fortunately, cause it's okay for it to be the only means, um, uh, uh, there, I don't, I don't know what an alternative to it is, Jenny, like this, what we're doing today is good, but it's really not an alternative to that. Like that's like, I want to be like, I was in London with you guys a couple of years ago for the event in person. Like that's. That's the thing, right? Because most of these individuals here are not gonna really be able to like communicate with me and for me to communicate with them this way. But in that event, when I'm like a little bit tipsy, somebody's gonna be able to get my card and then we're gonna start talking. And the next day I'm already in London and you're gonna take me out to lunch or dinner or breakfast and we're gonna keep talking. It's just, this atmosphere is good. We can, we can kind of like, it's a good keeping the fire burning, but it's not the same. It's not the same experience. And like, look, I would have been in London um, tomorrow for the Biffas, but like, you know, for us now as Canadians, we have to quarantine because of Omicron. And the idea that I have to quarantine until I get my results just would not allow for me to turn a two day trip as Jenny and, and Elliot know, I usually come in for 48 hours and I'm out. It was going to become a five day trip. And um, we're going to LA next week to shoot a Stephen King film actually. So a short, a short film based on one of his stories, which is kind of cool. Um, so I, I couldn't I couldn't mess around with that, but uh, I, I really wish I was there. And hopefully, as soon as we're back to normal, we'll do it in person. I will be on the next flight out. Definitely. Ali, you just mentioned the Stephen King short. Can you just tell us very quickly how you managed to get hold of that, how that happened? Yeah, so really, really fun, quick story. Um, I was with my brother-in-law, who's also a writer. So all, everybody around me is in the industry. I was with them and uh, we were at an Iranian wedding. And we came home at three in the morning drunk and he goes on Reddit and he sees that Stephen King uh, is an article that Stephen King has made five of his short stories available for bids, creative bids of why you should make it. And he does this every few years. They're called the dollar babies, actually, because the price to get it is for a dollar. And, and we were drunk. So we're like, let's say we're going to do a Stephen King film entirely in Farsi, just like the Persian language, because nobody's ever done a foreign language version of his film uh, and, and, and like an, a, an actual uh, authorized one. So we submitted it. By the time we woke up three in the afternoon, they had already countersigned the contract and sent it back to us. So we got that basically that story in our sleep. Literally, I said, we got access to it in our sleep. Um, and, 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 and they were like, yeah, of course, we want to see a Farsi rendition of it. And I'm of Iranian descent. So I went to all of my LA Hollywood co Iranian American contacts, uh, contacts. And I said, hey, do you want to be a part of history? Because nobody's ever done it. And, and everybody's like, yes, we want to be a part of history. And then I saw, and I said, by the way, he wrote this story about Sherlock and Watson, which he has never done before either. So it was Stephen King writing about fictitious characters, in which case Watson solves the mystery, not, not Sherlock. Like lots of number ones, I mean, lots of number ones. So, so we easily got like, you know, the who's who of the Iranian American community behind it. We were able to do an Indiegogo campaign and raise like 30,000 bucks in our sleep because everybody and their grandmother wanted to be a part of it in the Iranian community. Um, and then, and then that's, that's how we got, we got to doing it. And then COVID wiped us out um, the first time we were going to go to production. COVID wiped us out the second time we were going to go into production. And currently COVID is fucking with us on the third time because of Omicron. So let's see how that plays out. Um, but the, the restrictions are just coming in hard. Um, so yeah, that's, that's how that came out. And look, anybody could do it, right? Like it was just a great idea. Like let's just submit it in Farsi. Like who's going who's gonna to submit a foreign language idea? They're all going to be like, oh, we're going to do this with that. Our, our 
literally we'll do this film in Farsi. That's it. <laughs> it's literally our pitch. Like we had nothing else. I mean, yeah, I have to put in like your resume and all of that to say you're filmmakers, but in reality, the pitch was one sentence. That was our angle. Um, and then it got done. I, I don't know if I can catch up to these questions that you start volunteering to Ali. Um, I never really volunteered in any way because my whole company was like a startup volunteer, right? Like, yes, just so that everyone knows we started in 2003 and we were in the red until 2011. I owed probably close to half a million dollars in various debts by 2011. From 11 to 2014, it took us to just get into black. From 2014 onwards, there was profit but like, you know, substandard living condition level of profits. Like it wasn't profit, profit. Then it got really good right before COVID and then COVID came in again. But it's not, it's not an easy business, guys. It's not. It's not an easy business as indie. If your name has indie in front of it, indie anything, it's hard. But it's also friggin' fun. I enjoy doing it and I'll do it forever because it's great. Um, yeah. <laughs> Randall with the not stop jokes. Um, okay, any anything else? Anything else? I'm happy to say as long as anyone wants, but I just want to make sure like the time is of, of value to you. So, well, it's been absolutely of value so far. It's been absolutely brilliant. Um, if anybody does have any burning questions, feel free to unmute yourselves um, or stick it in the chat. Yeah, and then. Do be brave. Yeah, hi, Oli. Thank you for doing this. Hey, um, why not focus more on features instead of shorts? Two reasons. Um, I genuinely enjoy doing shorts. I know it sounds crazy, but I actually genuinely enjoy doing them. So it gives me pleasure. I've done features. I've done five feature films. So it's, it's just feature films are honestly work. As a producer, like after work, short films is fun. Um, I, so the reason that's reason number one, reason number two is, um, I, you get to work on a short film, you get to experience in a very confined environment, the good and the bad, and then you learn what you don't want to do and who you want to work with and who you don't want to work with. And then it just makes the filmmaking industry just so much more pleasant. Indie filmmaking is hard and it's, and it's, it wears you down. I have more friends who have quit over the years and I still have friends in the industry from, from when I started for various, various reasons because it does take a toll on you. So I, I just thought to myself, if I'm, gonna, if I'm gonna do this hardest thing ever on the planet, I gotta make sure at the very least I enjoy the hell out of it. And short films is just meeting new people. You shoot internationally. Some of those go ahead and become like superstars. Like, you know, when Mina was doing the Aladdin tour, I was like with them, man. We did London and we did Paris and we did Germany and it was just like, you got, I, got, I got to experience something I normally never, ever would have been able to experience. And I cultivated that relationship with them from short films. Like my revenue generating means are, believe it or not, consulting. And, and I get the consulting opportunities actually because of the amount of short films that I've done and the wins that we have and the just overall experience, right? So yeah, I personally make my money off of consulting. I don't make it off of shorts. Shorts are just something I have fun with. And then they just create additional opportunities. It's not a pathway I suggest for any of you guys to get locked into shorts. If you're going to do a short, it needs to be a jump off point to whatever your next thing is. And that's really how you leverage, uh, leverage a short. I fell into it and just the way that it worked out, it worked out good for me. But it is not a model to follow to have a career or to be able to make income. Um, it's just not easy. Um, but it's fun as hell. So if, you just, if you're financially stable and you want to have the time of your life, then make shorts forever. You will have the time of your life. Um, and like, you know, I'm beginning to sort of be that guy, right? In some ways, right? Like uh, even like getting like, uh, you know, JK Simmons on Spaceman. Um, we're actually getting another big name on Spaceman to go match up to him uh, for another sequence of it. We haven't gotten to a point where, you know, we've locked, but like, like that's kind of new. The getting the level of actors, usually these types of actors do their own buddies films. They don't really come and do strangers. So we're actually paving the way to say short films are a legitimate form of entertainment as well too, that can have $100,000 budgets and can have like Oscar winners and nominees associated with them. Um, we're working on another one with Amanda Seyfried, hopefully uh, next year as well too, if everything goes well with my pitch. So, um, you know, like that's, it's fun, man. That's, that's, that's the reason why I, I, I'm, I'm not gonna move into something that's gonna be stressful and feature films, 
actually require work and short films are just like, for me, it's just fine. So that's not trying to give you a cop-out answer. I'm trying to give you the truth, but I wouldn't recommend it to anybody as a form of a career. Um, I fell into it. I wasn't planning on doing short films forever. All right. A a anything else, guys? Go donate to that charity and then we can talk. The link is on my Instagram. You can donate any amount that you want and you just let me know that you did and I will talk to you and somebody in the next eight hours is going to win that quadruple autograph painting. So, and you're saving kids' lives during Christmas time for operations. So yeah, you want to you get my attention? That's, that's the best way of doing it. Um, yeah, a a anything else? Anyone else? <laughs> oh everybody's being shy all right <laughs> it's been absolutely amazing ali thank you so much always thank you all for coming in like we all have one thing in common right we're sitting and going through this for an hour and a half we all have one thing in common uh filmmaking so hopefully in the, in the past hour we gave you guys some inspiration on how you can do it jillian is living proof of it uh, and if she can do it under those circumstances and conditions, everybody can find the right partner and create content with. And if it's most likely not going to be me, but whoever that whoever that it is, just do your research and figure it out. And if it's me, then you and I will do something like this two years from now when we revive this uh, type of uh, a session where we talk about, you know, teamwork and success. Oh, thank you so much. And hopefully we'll get to see you in London soon, Ali. Second Omicron goes and before some new thing replaces it, I'll be there. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you Thanks all. so much. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks, Pleasure. Good night. Thanks. Bye. Bye.